as Samarat mentioned, I'm a vertebrate paleontologist. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, what I think of as strange and wonderful creatures. Um, I'm going to talk about how we figure out what they did and what they um, how they worked, um, and maybe why it might matter to understand that, why it's useful to us as scientists to understand these things. Um, you know, I got interested in paleontology um, as a as a consequence of some of these strange creatures. And so I'll talk a little bit about how you how you use them scientifically. What are what are they um, interesting for? Um, before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about why I got into this realm of science. Um, as as Brian and Samrat mentioned, I um, I'm from Tennessee. I grew up actually in East Tennessee. Um, this is a picture of a um, place on the French Broad River, about a mile from the house where I grew up, um, and. Growing up in this sort of rural kind of context, um, I spent a lot of time experiencing um, the natural world. I spent a lot of time, you know, walking around, um, going for for walks and for hikes around the neighborhood, and and that kind of thing. Um, and the the area where I grew up, as it happens, um, is kind of a a biodiversity hotspot. So um, if you if you look at this map here, um, the area around Knoxville where I grew up is sort of right here at the edge of this um, outrageously biodiverse area um, in the Appalachian Mountains, right? Um, I was also about an hour's drive from the Smoky Mountains, and so we would go up into the Great Smoky Mountains and um, go for hikes and, and wade in the creeks and, um, and mess around and appreciate the biodiversity. Um, and so one of the things that's that's interested me from the time I was really young was um, was the diversity of life and why things are the way they are. Like what what is um, what makes things ecologically different, um, and why do do animals and plants do the things they do in ecosystems? It's always been a, a source of real curiosity for me. Um, when I was in high school, I attended Oak Ridge High School in East Tennessee. Um, and um, in case you aren't familiar with the area, um, Oak Ridge is the town where they refined the uranium uh, and some of the plutonium for the atomic bombs during World War II. And um, it was the site of a national lab thereafter. So they built a, a lab there um, that drew a lot of scientists. And so it was a high school experience that really um, kind of um, cultivated science and STEM um, in a lot of us. Um, and I went after science camp from there to the University of Tennessee, um, where I started out studying conservation biology. And I was really interested in conservation, which is a strange thing for a paleontologist, right? Given that we study things that are mostly, it's a bit late for conservation, right? Um, but um, around my fourth year of college, I got um, kind of done with all of the relevant courses in the biology department, and I took a paleontology class in the Earth and Planetary Sciences department um, and just got really excited about paleontology um, and thinking about ways to, um, to integrate that with an understanding of biology. Um, and so I took the education in both earth sciences and in biology um, to um, UC Berkeley, which has a really interesting um, program for those of us who are interested in paleontology. So this is a picture from the biology building there. Um, and um, any of you from, um, if there's any Northern California denizens in the uh, neighborhood, you might've been uh, through there before. They have this great T-Rex skeleton mounted in the, the lobby. Um, but from the point of view of thinking about strange and wonderful creatures, you know, not only is T-Rex itself a, a really odd um, creature, but this space is a great place for those of us who want to understand the biology of extinct creatures. So in the biology building at Berkeley, the first floor here, like right where this T-Rex is standing, has the UC Museum of Paleontology, which is the, um, the state repository for fossils in California. 
If you go up that little spiral staircase behind the T-Rex, the second floor is the biology department and the biology library there. And then the third floor, which you can just kind of see, is up the second set of spiral stairs, has the UC Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. So that's the museum where all the modern mammals are. Um, and in my graduate education at Berkeley, um, you know, it, it was really, it was possible to go to paleontology seminars and on the, the first floor and then, you know, the next day go up to the third floor and see a seminar in the Vertebrate Zoology Museum on modern biology. And so that integration across um, modern biology and paleontology was really baked into my graduate education. Um, and so I worked with people from modern biology, from ecology, from evolutionary science and, and so forth, as well as paleontologists and geologists in the course of my, um, my time there. Um, so um, during the course of my graduate degree, um, I got really interested in the evolution of ecology in fossil mammals. And I took that interest to a place called the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center um, in Durham, North Carolina, um, and was really studying the evolution of, of burrowing in particular, burrowing in, um, in fossil mammals um, while I was there. Um, and that was another opportunity to work across, um, integrating across a lot of different um, a lot of different disciplines and a lot of different areas of biology with a lot of different people. So um, the science I'm going to talk about is the kind of science that you do um, with this sort of integrative background, right? I've always been interested in the ways you can pull information together from a lot of different scientific disciplines um, and answer kind of complex questions. So um, just to give you an idea of where we're going, I'm going to talk a little bit about strange creatures and, and the weird and wonderful animals in the world, both living and extinct. Um, but I want to get to how we understand ecology in the extinct ones, right? It's a little easier to understand ecology in living creatures. Um, but I want to think about how we can use what we know about ecology um, and, and other aspects of the biology of modern animals in order to understand the ecology of extinct creatures um, and some of the, the mental gymnastics we have to do to get there. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how we make these ecological inferences um, using um, horned rodents, which are my personal favorite creatures on the planet, even though they're not really on the planet anymore. Um, and then saber-toothed cats, which are maybe a slightly more relatable example um, and one that you might have spent some time thinking about yourself if you've been to a paleontology museum. Um, and I'll finish off um, by giving you just some sense of um, why it matters to study these things. It might seem like a really weird and irrelevant bit of science to be worrying about, but um, I'll make an argument that um, it might matter to all of us to understand what strange creatures did in the past. So um, as a paleontologist, I'm familiar with a whole lot of extinct things that um, that are really strange. And there's a lot of things in the fossil record that are, that are odd. Um, but there are also some weird and wonderful mammals alive today. Um, and I just want to acknowledge that, you know, if you if you spend enough time in biology, you don't have to go into the fossil record to find um, animals with really strange and unusual appearances um, and where that appearance might um, create a moment for, you know, curiosity, right? Um, all of us are, are engaged in science out of curiosity. This is a fundamentally curiosity-driven um, area, right? It's it's wanting to know how the world works that gets us here, right? Um, and I find, at least for me, that um, some of the, the strange creatures in the world are part of my um, my inspiration for, um, for doing the science that I do, right? Um, and so like, just, just as your, you know, list for um, things to Google when you, when you need to have some strange and wonderful biology in your world. Um, these are some of the, the strange things that we have alive today. If you haven't seen these guys, these are, um, these are fun to look at, right? So 
Um, you know, everything today from, you know, pangolins, which are, you know, scaly anteaters um, and always look like they're very concerned for your happiness and well-being when they're, um, you know, standing around there. Um, you know, I got really excited when I was in graduate school about uh, the ecology of fossil um, burrowing mammals. But even today, we have a, a remarkable diversity of burrowing mammals, right? Um, you're all probably familiar with naked mole rats, which are strange, and why? Why? Why does it not have hair? Um, this is the kind of question that drives a lot of good biology. Um, you know, here's a, a less familiar burrowing mammal. This is a marsupial mole in South America. Um, sorry, not South America, in Australia. Um, so, you know, somebody else's mole evolved from an ancestor that looked kind of like a possum, right? Um, you know, this is a a burrowing mammal that um, that does things in a really different way from moles that we see today. And the resemblances between um, moles and marsupial moles are um, driven by convergent evolution. They're driven by evolution into the same kind of form, right? And then there are some of these things that that don't look like other things around, right? We have, um, you know, little trunky creatures like tapirs and saiga antelope. Um, there are things that, you know, have evolved from the familiar to to less familiar, right? So, um, ring-tailed cats here are um, basically long, skinny raccoons that that um, that climb trees and do things that are ecologically different from. Um, from the way raccoons get around, right? So just today, just with the extant diversity of life, um, there's um, there's a lot to be um, amazed at. And of course, I'm showing my biases here. I work on mammals. Um, if we wanted to get into all the wonderful creatures that are not mammals, there's a lot of even weirder and less familiar things, certainly. Um, when we look in the fossil record, um, you know, sometimes we find things that are extinct, but that that remain familiar if you're familiar with the diversity of living things um, today, right? So um, the top two pictures here um, are a pair of skeletons of um, Mesozoic mammals, so mammals from the age of dinosaurs. Um, and when we think of Mesozoic mammals, we tend to think of little shrewy things running around under the dinosaur's toes, right? And, and we have this idea that all mammals then were like little ratty, shrewy creatures. Um, and one of the things that we find when we look in the in the fossil record is we see familiar forms, but from different lineages. So um, both of these are very, very distantly related to, to modern mammals. They don't have any living descendants. Um, but here's one called Frutifosser from a Mesozoic site in Colorado um, that if you look at it, you can kind of figure out what it did, right? You can say, oh, well, look, at this. it's got these little short feet um, and it's kind of a wide sprawling stance. It's kind of a chunky little guy. Um, and the resemblance between the skeleton of Frutifosser here um, and an armadillo, if you take the shell off, um, is pretty remarkable, right? And so it's pretty easy to make this, make an analog here and say, look, the shape, the form, the, the morphology of this extinct, um, armadillo-like creature suggests some similarities to armadillos. Um, and, you know, additional work has shown that, yes, like an armadillo, Bruta Fosser here was, was a burrower. Um, like an armadillo, it probably ate a lot of bugs, right? Um, like an armadillo, it seems to have um, sort of gotten around in a terrestrial environment, right, and, and cruised around um, looking for bugs in amongst the trees, right? So, um, so there's one where you can make an easy analog, right? But it's kind of surprising to find something like an armadillo without a shell in the middle of the age of dinosaurs, right? Um, you know, similarly, um, you know, this thing here is uh, was a mammal known as Castoricotta. Um, it's from the um, Mesozoic, from the Jurassic of um, of China. And Castoricotta actually is fossilized. You get, um, we got a little bit of a body impression, but you can see it looks a whole lot like a beaver, right? So it's got a long um, tail without, um, with the, um, the vertebrae are kind of flat. Um, it's got these um, sort of short clawed feet. Um, 
and the shape of the forelimbs and so forth suggests a swimming habit. Um, and in fact, we find it in an environment where it um, it suggests that it was a another beaver-like mammal. So sometimes we find extinct things and we can make a pretty tight analog. We can say, oh yeah, here's this extinct creature. We don't exactly know what it is, but it looks just like this um, extant one. So sometimes the job is easy, but it turns out that a lot of the time the job is not so easy figuring out what extinct things did. Um, and here's some examples um, of extinct creatures that really um, that really don't fit, right? Um, this one here on the left, this is, you know, people ask me like, how did you end up a paleontologist? Why did you do paleontology? And when I really think about it, a big part of the reason is this, this guy here. So this is the ground sloth in the Smithsonian's exhibit in Washington, DC. Um, and so if any of you have ever been to the Museum of Natural History, the, um, the National Museum there, um, on the mall in DC, they've always had a ground sloth skeleton mounted. Um, and I was 12 years old when I went to the Smithsonian and had my mind absolutely blown by that ground sloth skeleton. It's so big. And the idea that this is related to modern sloths, which are, you know, like a double handful, but not, you know, 10 feet tall, um, just, just mind blowing, right? So, um, and and ground sloths are something where you can't do what I just did with those two Mesozoic mammals. You can't say, oh, well, it's just it's pretty much just like this thing, right? It's 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 just a much older version of a beaver. It's a much older ground sloths are like nothing alive today. Okay, you will not find a big creature that gets up on its hind legs and has these giant claws like this. If you're looking for a skeleton of something that looks like a ground sloth, you're not gonna get close, right? They're, they're so strange, right? Um, and of course, you know, all of us went through our dino dinosaur phase or maybe some of you didn't, um, you know, I don't remember mine. Um, I certainly outgrew it a long time ago, but they're, you know, dinosaurs are all, in the weird extinct creatures category, right? Um, you know, the ones that really, I find really mind blowing and, and that really test my abilities as a scientist to understand what it could have done are um, the sauropods, these long necked dinosaurs. These guys are so large that they kind of break our equations for how big an animal can be and still live on land, right? Um, you know, people have tried to make um, predictive models for how large uh, an herbivore can get. And um, some of the largest sauropods are bigger than they should be able to be, right? So this is challenging our understanding of science. And this is the moment where, um, where as paleontologists, we have work to do, right? Um, really, you know, crazy creatures that also tell us something about the way biology works. Um, so pretty exciting. And um, just to round it off for those of you who are, you know, following along at home, this is, this last one here on the right is a um, a thing called um, Diplocolis. It's a, a weird amphibian from the, the late Permian. So from 250 or more like 260 million years ago. Um, and everybody really fixates on the fact that its skull looks like a boomerang. Um, what did it do? Probably some of the same things that a lot of early amphibians do, right? Um, and understanding how Diplocolis works tells us a bit about how life got out on land, right? So some of these early, um, uh, early terrestrial creatures um, give us some understanding of this. Um, <laughs> I'm loving the question about um, the, the features of a creature specialized to live in cities. Um, this is exactly the kind of question that, you know, as a, as a paleontologist, you have to be able to ask, right? So um, as a biologist, as a paleontologist in a lot of ways, what would it look like for something to, to specialize on living in cities? It's a good question and one we can talk about more for sure. So um, the tool I'm gonna show you for, for figuring these things out. Um, I'm gonna to demonstrate today in a couple of examples um, 
functional morphology. And for those who aren't, who haven't, you know, run into this before, it's a, it, it is what it sounds like. So this is the study of how an organism's shape or its morphology is influenced by function. Um, it draws really he heavily on anatomy. Um, one of the, the funny bits of trivia that um, I think a lot of people don't know um, is that paleontologists are frequent, frequently employed teaching anatomy. So if you take anatomy in a medical school, the odds are something like 50-50 that the person who teaches your medical anatomy course is a paleontologist. Um, and the reason for that is that um, paleontologists have nothing but anatomy to work with, right? Most fossils, you can't get genetic material out of it. Um, you know, Jurassic Park aside, hate to disappoint you all, but most fossils are long past the point where you could find any um, still, you know, assembled DNA in them, even Pleistocene things, so things from a couple million years ago, um, mostly do not have um, any usable DNA to, to work with. Um, and most of the fossil record is a great deal older than that, right? Um, the other aspect of how we do this functional morphology, how we use the morphology of these strange animals to figure out what they did, um, requires some, some funny understanding of the philosophy of science. So I'm gonna take just a, a couple of moments um, to talk about how we, how we do science as paleontologists, given that some of the ways you've learned to do science in school don't actually um, apply. So when we ask questions about, you know, why some morphology evolved, right? Why does this dinosaur have a really long neck? Why do ground sloths have gigantic claws? You know, why is this feature there? Um, we have to use some approaches that, that may not be quite as familiar. So um, I'm going to talk about the, the way we make inferences in historical science. So historical science is um, the approaches to science we take for looking in the past. And it applies in cases that are not subject to experimental manipulation. So what's an example? Um, What's an example of something that isn't subject to experimental manipulation? Well, if you're asking a scientific question about um, something that was extinct in the past, um, you might not be able to, to go and mess with it because it's, it's gone, right? Until we get that time machine going, right? Um, we're stuck with what's already happened. There's also some other areas of science that, that get into this space. So, um, climate science, for example, um, is often dealing with historical science inference because you can't make Earth's climate in the lab, right? And you can't um, tweak the, the conditions other than in a model, which we can all acknowledge is not quite, um, not quite the same, right? So a model is only as good as what you put into it, right? And it is one scientific tool but it's another of the tools that we use in this kind of sense, okay? Um, in terms of what we're doing with historical science, um, it's actually philosophically somewhat similar to experimental science, right? Well, what's the, what's the scientific method? What do we, you know, how does this, this thing work? Um, you've all, you know, been told how this works from the time you were in grade school, right? Like, um, you make some observations, you make hypotheses about those observations, you set up an experimental test um, that, you know, if your hypothesis is correct, um, you know, one thing will happen, and if your hypothesis is wrong, something else will happen, um, and you determine whether or not your understanding of the system is correct, right? Um, if you can't do that, if you can't do that manipulation of the system, because the thing you're looking for is extinct, or um, because you're talking about something that operates only at the scale of the whole earth and you can't make a tiny little scale model of the earth or whatever, um, then what you have to do is actually look at when similar changes have happened in the past and take advantage of the information from, from the, the record left by it, okay? So 
um, essentially you're you're performing an experiment in the past by looking for times when the phenomenon that you're interested in um, has changed in the past, right? Um, it's easy to look at that and say, yeah, but you don't have control, right? So it's not really science because um, you're not controlling the whole thing. And so you don't know whether it would have worked the same way again, right? This is true. So there are some advantages and there are some disadvantages to this. Um, the advantage you get from a historical um, experiment um, has to do with this thing we call the asymmetry of overdetermination, um, which is the kind of phrase that a historian of science would use to um, explain um, this kind of thing. Essentially, so the philosophical explanation of this is that events are underdetermined by their causes and they overdetermine their events, which means you can know all the things that might cause an event to happen. Um, but in a lot of cases in complex systems, um, you can't necessarily predict them, right? Think about earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. We understand a whole lot about how they work and what causes them, but actually making them happen is something of a chaotic process. And so the, those events are under underdetermined by their causes. We know why earthquakes happen, but those events don't happen necessarily every time you look at those causes, right? Um, and so that means that experimental science, sometimes your experiment will fail just because you don't have a complete understanding of all of the causation, right? So you don't understand what all the confounding factors are. And you spend a whole lot of time in experimental science dealing with that problem. The great thing about historical science is that while we may not have the whole picture, the events that we're looking at, the changes that happen, um, they overdetermine their effects. That means they create a whole lot of evidence of the fact that they happened, right? Forensic science deals in a very similar um, space, right? They, um, they deal with events that left a lot of evidence behind and you don't necessarily need all of it in order to understand what happened, okay? So in short, in historical science, we're taking advantage of the fact that it's a lot easier to figure out that something did happen, then predict what will happen in the future, okay? So this is the payoff for the fact that we don't get control of what happens, right? We can look back and see how things have changed in the past um, and figure them out. But it requires um, really thinking about all of the possible causes of an event, right? Because there are many things going on at once that we don't have control of. And the clever part is in finding ways of eliminating all but one of the possible causes for a particular event, right? Um, and this is something that that is, you know, cleverly philosophically referred to as the smoking gun, right? It's the um, it's the piece of evidence that really um, puts the nail in the coffin, says that it can only be one of the the possible causes. But this means that a whole lot of the work has to be on the front end, figuring out what might be, right? Which is the, the fun speculative part of science. But if you don't do it really completely in historical science, you might miss a possibility. You might eliminate all the causes you can think of, right? All the ways that things might have, have come about that you, that you can imagine in your head. And you might still leave more than one possibility on the table, right? So this is always the, the source of uncertainty. Just as in experimental science, there's always that possibility of um, you know, uncontrolled variables that you that you didn't know about, right? The the guy that came through while your experiment was running overnight and like, you know, poked the fish tank or something like that, right? Those uncontrolled variables in an experimental sense also exist in a historical kind of framework. So this is really vague and conceptual. So I'm going to make it 
concrete um, with one of my favorite examples from the fossil record, um, which are horned rodents, okay? Um, if you didn't know that these exist, um, now you do, you're welcome. Um, this may haunt your nightmares, but um, this is, is one of those strange and wonderful weird extinct creatures. Um, and this was the one that, um, that inspired a big chunk of my dissertation research. Um, this is a thing known as Ceratogallus. Um, and if you know your Greek, the name doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It results in from you know a whole series of different named things. But Ceratogallus here um, is a rodent from the Miocene. So they're around from about 15 million years ago until about mm, five million years ago, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and um, they appear on the scene um, around the time that we start to see the evolution of grasslands in North America. Um, and the thing that's really weird, the, the thing that is the, you know, OMG, we have work to do kind of moment with these um, is definitely these big pointy horns on their head. Okay. Um, in case you're wondering whether your knowledge of modern biodiversity is incomplete, um, it's not, there is no living rodent that has um, horns on its nose. In fact, there's no living rodent that has horns of any kind, okay? Rodents don't do horns, they're just not a thing. Um, but they did, right? Um, and there's this great question in the in the chat about answering these questions and, and, um, and where they start. Um, and you're correct, whoops, you're correct that the questions start with the, the why, like so many, um, good science questions, it starts with an observation, right? Um, and this one, we're gonna lead with the observation that there is a rodent and it had horns. And we would like to know what it tells us that there were horned rodents 15 million years ago, right? Why do horned rodents come about? What did they do with their horns? And how are they different from anything alive today, okay? Um, so these guys are about the size of a groundhog or a marmot, if you're familiar with those, right? So, you know, a rodent a little bigger than your head. Um, and if you imagine a groundhog with horns on its nose, it's not a bad analog for what's going on morphologically here, right? Um, so why? Why? What, what could a burrowing rodent do with horns, right? What are those good for? Um, this is the kind of question that, um, you know, that starts these, um, these ecological studies, right? So um, I have a list. I'll talk about the things that I can think of. If some of you think of other things that a burrowing rodent could do with its horns, I encourage you um, to share those with me because I will not be done with this study anytime in this lifetime, right? Um, so what could a burrowing rodent do with its horns? Um, one suggestion anybody makes anytime you have a creature with horns is sexual display, right? We're all pretty familiar with deer um, and antelope and things like that. And um, man, that is all about, you know, showing off and, um, you know, impressing potential mates, right? Um, I'm going to make a distinction here um, between sexual display, which is just showing off, um, Birds do it with their feathers. There's a whole lot of species that do this in, in a bunch of different realms. Um, and um, sexual combat, which is um, a bit more like what you see um, deer doing. They actually fight with their antlers. Um, technically, they're not horns, they're antlers. If you want to know the difference, I can talk about it later. Um, so two different forms of kind of sexual um, displays. They're related to, to obtaining mates. They're all about social behavior and um, also demonstrating male condition, right? So um, sexual displays are showing off features that um, demonstrate that the male is in good physical shape. He can take care of himself, so he must have great genes. Sexual combat, same kind of story, right? Like, oh, he's really strong. He must be well-fed. He must have good genes. He must be worth breeding with, right? Um, so, you know, anytime you have something like horns, people make that analog to, you know, deer and cows and moose and antelope, and they think about um, whether this is some kind of um, structure related to um, 
so to impressing mates, right? Um, because it's on a burrowing rodent, right? You saw those big digging claws. Um, another speculation that, that you see um, is that these horns are for digging. Um, so they're a structure that might help them excavate their burrows. Um, you know, if you think about marmots, they spend a whole lot of their time burrowing and a whole lot of their morphology is really constrained by being an efficient burrower because moving soil is a lot of work. So could horns be a structure that might help them with digging? Um, and then, um, you know, the last possibility where horns are involved is, is always um, defense, right? There's a lot of creatures we know of that um, use their horns in defense against predators, right? And this is, you know, horns on a little rodent. Rodents are snacks for carnivores all over the place, right? And so, um, so it's certainly a possibility that these horns are a defensive structure that might help them protect themselves, okay? So what do we do with this, right? Everybody's got their own speculation. Um, how do we figure it out? Well, really, the next step here is to figure out the predictions of these hypotheses. Just as you would design an experiment based on a hypothesis in the experimental design kind of um, system, you can also look at um, you know, the predictions of these hypotheses for what we would see in the fossil record in order to figure out what the likely explanations are for this feature. Um, so, for example, um, those hypotheses have some different predictions for um, which creatures would have horns, right? So if it's a sexual display or sexual combat feature in mammals, we would expect that to be something you would see mostly in males or they would be bigger in males or, um, or whatever because most sexual combats and sexual displays are by males in mammals. This is because of the difference in sexual investment between males and females. So incubating young is something that takes a lot of um, a lot of energy. It takes a lot of um, you know investment by the female, and so the female has to decide on a male to make that investment with because the male investment is smaller. Um, generally, all of the sort of burden of of showing off for a mate. Uh, falls on the males in mammalian lineages. Okay, so if horns are a sexual display or sexual combat feature, we expect to see it only in male individuals, right? Whereas if it's burrowing or defense, it doesn't matter what gender you are, you still have to defend yourself, right? You still have to dig a hole. Um, and so that would not be a sexually dimorphic feature if that's the case there, right? Um, if you're dealing with sexual display or sexual combat, those are social behaviors. Right, that that would require they be a social species at least at some level, um, and I'll explain why this is important in a minute. That means that vision is rather important. The ability to um, um, to see and and um, be aware of the outcomes of sexual display and sexual sexual combat um, is quite important. Otherwise, you're not going to put a lot of investment into building horns if nobody can see how it all comes out. Um, whereas, you know, if you're using them for something like digging or like defense, it's less important that you have high degrees of visual acuity. Um, vision is something that leaves marks in the skeleton because your optic nerve has to go from your brain through your skull to your eyes. Um, and it turns out the optic nerve goes through a little hole in the skull that's all by itself. And so you can tell how big something's optic nerve was based on the size of the optic foramen, um, which is in a well-preserved skull, a pretty obvious little hole in the back of the eye socket. So, um, you know, these are both predictions that we have the capacity to look at in the fossil record, right? We can look at whether we see sexually dimorphic, you know, you know populations that have different um, different shapes um, in males and females. We can look at visual acuity um, in the fossil record to figure out whether or not these um, hypotheses hold water, right? When we look at it, um, the last thing um, that we can think about is because horned rodents existed over several million years and evolved several different species. Um, we can make some predictions about how natural selection ought to be shaping those horns based on how they're being used, right? So if the horns are being used in sexual display or sexual combat, um, 
we we expect to see them get more extreme over time, right? We see that evolution that selection is going to be selecting for the bigger, better, you know, showier, you know, more dangerous, whatever weapon for these sexual displays because the females are picking the extremes, right? So over time, if they're used in that kind of context, you expect to see those changes, right? Um, if they're being used for digging, you expect their effectiveness for digging to increase over time, right? Um, and if they're being used for, um, for defense, you expect them to get sort of bigger and more effective at defending the species, right? So um, because we can look at their trajectory over evolutionary time, we can see how they're being changed and shaped by selection over time. And that will let us understand something about you know, what makes them more functional, right? As they get different over time, um, we can see what makes them better at doing whatever function they're doing, right? So what does it look like? I'm gonna spoil it in the course of my presentation. I will tell you what the answer is, right? Um, so first, all of those sexual display, sexual combat kind of hypotheses um, suggest there should be sexual dimorphism, okay? This isn't quite as easy as you might hope. Um, you probably know that human skeletons are distinct by sex. Um, it turns out that rodent skeletons are a little harder to tell apart by sex unless they're really exceptionally well preserved. Um, and skulls, heaven help you, like there is no difference in the skulls of female and male rodents that we know of unless we've got species that we know something about today, which we definitely don't in this case. Um, but we can look at co-occurrence patterns because um, if you have a social species, then you expect males and females to co-occur at some level. Um, and if there's sexual dimorphism, if there's horns on the dudes and no horns on the females, then you would expect a skull like this one up here up top, our little horned rodent, in the same um, deposit as a skull like this one on the bottom that doesn't have horns, right? You'd expect them to come together, okay? And they might not be in the same proportions, it doesn't have to be equal, but you'd expect that mostly when you get a horned one, there should be some not horned ones as well, right? That they would co-occur. The other thing you, you can look at is um, the shape of other aspects of morphology that aren't related to what you're talking about, that aren't related to sexual combat. Um, so, here are some of the molar teeth. Um, the horned ones have molar teeth that look like this one on top here. And the unhorned ones have these really different looking teeth. Um, I want you to think about whether or not that makes any sense. I see you have a question. Greta, why don't you um, ask your question? Oh, yeah. Uh, I was wondering, like, what's a typical sample size for a study like this? Um, like, and, and like, how many fossils do you have access to? And like, What's the time range of like the earliest to the most recent? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so like, how do you sort of like, how are, are how you- How do you know if you have enough? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's a very good question because one of the things that we know about the fossil record is that there's not an infinite supply, right? Most things don't get fossilized. Um, fortunately for us, working in rodents, you get a few more than you do if you don't work on rodents, right? Um, so um, these guys conveniently occur in assemblages where you get lots and lots of them. Um, so um, the, the pictures here are from some sites in Nebraska. Um, this is from a trip I took to the University of Nebraska State Museum. And um, you do get lots of them. You get numerous skulls from a single site. Um, also, because their teeth are distinct, um, you can recognize them based on these molar teeth, and you often get dozens, if not hundreds, of isolated um, teeth that you can um, you can identify one way or another. And the short answer is here: um, it's it's theoretically possible that you could get sexual dimorphism because you do get um, some co-occurrence of um, horned and unhorned. Uh, forms of these rodents. Um, however, we don't have any analog today 
for a sexually dimorphic species, that is for a species that has some feature that you know it uses in um, in uh, mating related combat that also changes the shape of the cusps on their teeth, right? That this is just related to food processing and it's a pretty big difference in the shape of the teeth. So this is probably not just a sexually dimorphic difference between the unhorned and the horned um, forms of these rodents. They seem to be totally different species and probably actually different genera if you wanna get really nerdy about it, okay. So that's kind of a blow for the whole sexual display, sexual combat thing. Um, the other part of it um, has to do with um, vision. So the the, um, the optic nerve and the optic foramen. So here is the side of a skull. This is the orbit. So this is where the, the eye is. Um, and the optic foramen, you can kind of see is this tiny little pinprick right here. Um, for those of you not look, used to looking at optic foramina, that's a really small one. Um, in terms of comparisons, um, probably this thing would have been functionally blind, okay? So all your sexual display is a fat waste of time because nobody can see how it came out, all right? So vision and the you know sort of argument for sexual dimorphism aren't really holding water here. All right. Um, what about the trend through time? Um, because that was a, a really important part of um, maybe the difference between um, burrowing and um, sort of defensive related uses of these horns um, and sexual dimorphism. They do get bigger through time, which all the hypotheses predicted. But I want you to notice how they change. So this is a, an older. 15 million year old one, an early form. And this is a later seven million year old one. I want you to notice that the horns have done a couple of things. One is they've gotten bigger, way bigger and pointier, right? But the other thing they've done, here's the front of the nose, right? This is the back of the head, this is the front. Okay, it's a side view of the skull. The horn has moved from kind of the front of the nose towards the back the nose. Okay, so it's moved back on the head over time. So natural selection seems to be shaping it towards being farther back on the snoot over time. Okay, that's interesting. That's telling us something. What does that tell us about? Yeah, this is a quick question. Hello. Yes. Um, so with your limited sample size, you know, however limited, depending on whether you're doing rodents or another kind of animal, how do you distinguish um, traits that are common throughout the entire species or uh, traits that vary throughout each specimen? Like for example, I mean, humans can be all sorts of different sizes and shapes and like every thing's body looks different. Mm -hmm. Are there a lot of variations in between individual specimens? specimens? There are in some features and not in others. Um, these horns conveniently, they do vary some, um, but you can get a sense of that variation. And part of how you do it is knowing which features set up earlier in life and which ones keep changing through life. Um, so your teeth form really early. Um, so teeth tend to be really conservative and they don't vary as much. All right, so the shape of teeth was pretty consistent. You can use that to recognize what's a species. And then you have other features um, in terms of, um, you know, osteological features and things like that. Those show up later in life. And so those tend to be more variable. The key is really finding population samples, right? So getting a good sample with a lot of specimens and looking at the variation among the things that are pretty similar, right? So find the same kind of rodents, right? Um, which we can identify based on some larger aspects of morphology, and then say, how much variation do we see in these things that are all the same? Um, there's a lot of work to be done in that area, um, but it's an important thing to keep in mind. The neat thing is, though, with these horns, they vary some, but not a huge amount. Um, so within a population, they're pretty consistent, um, and we get multiple individuals with the same silly little horns on their face. So. So let's think about the morphology of these horns over time and how that, that changes over time. Okay, so for combat, 
um, if you're going to use um, the little horns in combat, um, you really have to think about how this might move on the head um, and how they might be able to, to present their horns to be able to attack one another. Okay, so I've got a little uh, diagram over here on the side and I'm gonna reduce it to its simplest form so that I can move it around. Okay, so this little red bit is gonna be the outline of the skull and then we've got the vertebrae here in green just for the part that the muscles attach to that move the head around. Okay, so if you take that distracting diagram out and we just sort of move it around, if I'm going to, to engage in combat with my fellow species, this is my range of motion. So I can just bring my head down and maybe I could maybe I could fence with them a little bit, okay. Um, but I gotta hope that the that the ladies can figure out um, what went on some way other than seeing it, because none of the above can see what's going on. All right. So range of motion plausible. Having those horns so far back on the nose is kind of problematic for this. You can see the the horn doesn't actually get all that far out in front, um, and many of the things that we see. Um, engaging in these sexual combats actually have much more projecting horns than this. These horns are getting less projecting over time. So maybe not the best case for combat here. Um, sorry, my slide is not poor, not well edited here. If we wanna think about digging, um, you know, we can again sort of move the, um, the skull around a little bit. And if you imagine it trying to dig against the surface, oops. Trying to dig against the surface of the burrow there, um, the challenge it's going to run into is those little horns can only scrape a really small hole, this kind of gray area here, um, before the nasal bone, this the front of the nose, is going to run up against the front of the burrow. So that horn is positioned so far back that using it for digging is really functionally not going to work well, right? You see that um, the nasal bone being so um, forward projecting in these things is actually getting in the way of using them for digging. So you wouldn't expect this to change morphologically in this way if they're evolving for um, for digging. Okay. What about defense? This is one where we get kind of a fun analog. So um, those of you who live in the, the Southwest and areas like that might have met this guy before. This is a horned lizard, um, also known as a horny toad. Um, it's not a toad, but it definitely does have horns, right? Um, these guys have little spiky horns that look kind of like this, um, that stick up, that they use to defend themselves against birds. Madison, I see you have a question. What's up? Uh, hi, I was just wondering, uh, do we have any fossil records of how their burrows were shaped? So maybe if they were digging up towards a ceiling more, would that provide a more effective method for digging with those types of horns? Totally fair. It's hard to dig if the if the body is elongate this way. It's hard to dig a burrow straight up that um, that you excavate in that fashion. And in fact, if we look at modern burrowing mammals, um, most of them have a really flat head like that hornless one I showed you because they use their head to pack the roof of their burrow. Gravity does not work in your favor if you dig straight up, right? because all the dirt ends up on your head. And um, using horns like these to dig up, not only would they also run into that nasal sort of collision with the surface problem, um, but they're not gonna get real far because they're basically gonna bring the roof of their burrow down on their heads. It's a, it's a good question. And there are things that dig sort of vertically, but they tend to dig sort of on an angle um, in order to, and get around the problem of gravity, all right? Um, so I'm out of time because I've run long, and so I can't talk in great detail about the second aspect of morphology. So I will leave you to speculate, or if people want to come to the Q&A and arm wave about saber-toothed cats, it's the same kind of problem, right? Here is a strange morphology. Here is a strange feature that we find in the fossil record. Figuring out why it happened, what it's good for, really requires um, dealing with 
um, functional morphology, coming up with all of the possible um, explanations and digging into them and their implications for the fossil record. So, um, so I don't want to leave this totally behind because I did get mildly derailed. Um, that's not anyone's fault other than my own. Um, if you look at the morphology of these horns, they actually work a whole lot like um, a horned lizard's horns do, right? So they're projecting upward, they get more upward projecting over time, they get longer over time, and they appear 15 million years ago at a time when a lot of burrowing predators, things like badgers and weasels come into North America um, and may have provided a selective pressure that might have driven this, right? So there's our current best answer. It's only as good as our confidence that we've explored all the possibilities, right? So, um, so this is a case of using functional morphology to understand a feature seems to be a defensive structure, um, but there's always more to do. Um, and saber-toothed cats provide us with the same kind of um, study system. So I'm gonna I'm gonna skip that for now, um, and I'll just remind you all that there's a good reason why we need to know the ecology of fossil animals, okay? Human impact on ecosystems today is really unprecedented. Um, we're changing a lot of things all at once. Um, we're changing climate, we're changing habitats, we're, um, we're altering soils and, and water and air and things all at the same time. But all of these are changes that have analogs in the past. Have we done it all at once as fast as humans are doing it now? No, but all of it has happened in the past. And so understanding where we're headed actually really requires an understanding of where we've been, right? So the past is the key to the present and to the future. And an understanding of the processes by which ecology evolves um, is really critical to solving these kinds of conservation problems. This may seem an excuse, to figure out weird animals, and it is, but this is why it matters to know what weird animals did, right? We're not going to understand what they experienced and how past changes shaped them without understanding how they worked and what they're telling us about ecosystems. So with that, thank all of you for your time.